Good evening, my friends. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Tom, and the color cast is on the air now for Monday night. It's November the 9th, 1998. Our old friend Buck O'Neill, baseball great, is here tonight. And Joy Krause, who has a great story of truly going from rags to riches by dint of hard work and endurance. And I hope that you'll stay tuned for the entire program tonight, as you do almost every night. What a day today. Loose crown here, leaking toilet in the guest room, and ripped off rear view mirror on the right hand side of the car. What a just a perfect day today. Just unbelievable. And of course, General Motors, in their wisdom, allowed the Cadillac dealership in Beverly Hills to be shut down. This is where most of the Cadillac drivers live, so what do they do? They shut it down. Nice going GM. Way to go. <laughs> you wonder why it's going like this. <laughs> you wonder why they sell all those Lexuses there in Beverly Hills, right? And what's that other luxury car, the Infiniti? They have a dealership in Beverly Hills. The Lincoln people have one there, but not the Cadillac people. No, 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 no. Then I'm watching TV. You know, I'm, I am a, a dinosaur in this business. Uh, years ago, when I worked uh, radio and television, where I had to keep the program log, we made sure that if we sold you a Ford at 910, we wouldn't run a Chevrolet ad till 920. You know what I mean? Or if we sold you a ticket on United Airlines at 9.45, we wouldn't try to sell you a ticket on Southwest Airways until 9.55. We tried to give some separation between sponsors that competed with each other or that were detrimental to each other. So I'm watching television this afternoon, and it reminded me of how old I am. They ran a spot that said, if you're having a heart attack, the best thing you can do is take a Bayer aspirin. Now, just think about that for a second. Never having had a heart attack, but having seen people undergo them, it's very difficult to walk into the bathroom, get the Bayer aspirin out of the medicine chest, and take it while you're having a heart attack. It just would seem to me that that would be a very, very difficult thing to do. But I'm no medical guy. I'm just a late-night weasel, okay? So they give me 30 seconds of, if you're having a heart attack, take an aspirin, right? Then they go to a commercial telling you how you can enhance every meal with French fried onion rings. <laughs> Is somebody not paying attention on the broadcast watch these days? Now? Anyway, what I thought we'd do tonight before Buck O'Neill joins us, we've had this in the past and had great success with it. These are performance reviews that were supposedly taken from actual employee performance evaluations. You know, people who for one reason or another were not doing the job to the satisfaction of their supervisors. For example, one supervisor wrote, since my last report, this employee has reached rock bottom and has begun to dig. Another wrote, his men would follow him anywhere, but only out of morbid curiosity. <laughs> Works well under constant supervision and cornered like a rat in a trap. <laughs> when she opens her mouth, it seems it is only to change feet. <laughs> These are people who really need improvement, huh? Uh, he would be out of his depth in a parking lot puddle. That's bad, huh? <laughs> he sets low standards and then consistently fails to achieve them. Uh, this employee is depriving a village of an idiot. <laughs> I think we've done that one before, yeah. But what's the difference, huh? Yeah, what are they going to do, take the show off the air? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this employee should go far, and the sooner he starts, the better. He's got a full six-pack, but lacks the plastic thingy to hold it all together. <laughs> the plastic thingy, yeah. A gross ignoramus, 144 times more stupid than an ordinary ignoramus. <laughs> uh, one employee, his supervisor wrote, he doesn't have ulcers, but he is a carrier. I would like to go hunting with him sometime. He would argue with a signpost. If you see two people talking and one looks bored, he's the other one. <laughs> he has two brains. One is lost and the other is out looking for it. Uh, if he were any more stupid, he'd have to be watered twice a week. <laughs> if you stand close enough to him, you can hear the ocean. <laughs> it's hard to believe he beat out a million other sperm. <laughs> of one employee, the supervisor wrote, the wheel is turning, but the hamster's dead. And finally, when his IQ reaches 50, he should sell. <laughs> Back with Buck O'Neill, later Joy Krause, you on the toll-free. I'm Tom, you're watching CBS, and thanks for catching our pictures as we fly him through the air. <laughs> Buck O'Neill played baseball along such Negro League great stars as Josh Gibson and Satchel Paige, but he faced the white players like Babe Ruth, 
only an exhibition contest because of the times. When Jackie Robinson broke baseball's color line, Buck was a bit old for the majors, but he went on to become a big league scout and a goodwill ambassador for all of baseball. He's now a spokesman for Kansas City's Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, and I'm pleased to welcome Buck O'Neill back to CBS, even though I call him Nancy in my dreams. Thank you very much, Tom. Nice to see you, Mr. O'Neill. November 13th, big day for you. You're 87 years young. That's right. That's right. And oh, oh, I feel so, so good about this because we've got a campaign on for the Negro League Baseball Museum membership drive, and they're going to do that for me. And I don't know of any better way they can do it is to take out a membership. Now, when, when, you say, when you say a membership, if one uh, subscribes to a membership in the Negro Baseball League Museum, what are the benefits that accrue to one for, for, for purchasing this membership? Oh, well, we got uh, different, different uh, uh, say it, uh, a $25 membership will get you uh, a pin, uh -huh. and an autograph uh, portrait of Buck O'Neill, and then if you come up with a $100 membership, you're going to get a baseball cap and a jacket and corporate structure. $1,000 going to get you so much just about everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and, and how would one contact the Negro Baseball that, League that, Museum? Uh, all you have to do, this toll-free number, would, it's, it's very easy to do. That's 888-221-NL, uh, Negro League Baseball Museum. That's NL. B M N N L B M. Yeah. It doesn't finish well, but it starts nice. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now let me ask you, because the season has come to a close since we chatted the last time. Yeah. But the, the tremendous performances by so many players this year, mm -hmm. but notably Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire and the home run derby. Was that not a wonderful thing? Outstanding. Yeah. Outstanding. You know, the greatest part about it is the way they held themselves. Yeah. And what they actually did is they started people to liking baseball players again because doing that strike a lot strike a lot of people fell out with baseball players mm -hmm. but right now a lot of people baseball fans are liking baseball players again and it's going to bring a lot of people back to baseball and going to start the kids in this country to start playing baseball again. You know, I was thinking this afternoon, when, when you look around baseball, you see a lot of fellas now from the Dominican Republic and from Cuba. Mm -hmm. But we don't see an awful lot of young minority kids from America who probably are more lured to football or basketball than baseball as the sport they want to play professionally, huh? That's true. That's true. Well, in, uh, uh, see, in, in, in the Dominican, Cuba, baseball is the sport. Baseball is just like it used to be here. Right. Right. Just like it used to be here, everybody played baseball. And uh, see, in those countries, that's the way out. And that was the way in the inner city for a kid to get out. That was the way for me to get out, mm -hmm. playing baseball. But right now, uh, you know, uh, Tom, during my era, the greatest athletes in the world played baseball. Because football, basketball was more or less... Uh, uh, college sports, right? But if you want to make a living professionally, you played baseball. So we got the best of the talent. But right now, the it's it's so many other ways to make a living. See, the best athlete in the world might be ducking the basketball, sure. throwing the football, catching the football, or serving the tennis ball a hundred miles. Or hitting the golf ball, or, or, hitting the go or hitting the golf ball. I thought, well, hitting the golf ball. There's so many ways now to make an outstanding living. Let me ask you here about Cuban baseball, because if my, if my research is correct, you played in Cuba. Yeah. What, what was it like playing in Cuba? Outstanding. Really? Because, oh, great baseball talent. Great baseball talent. And, and what I liked about it more than anything else, in Cuba, Tom, I was a baseball player here in my country. I was a black baseball player. Right, so there there was no racial line no, drawn. No, 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 I was a baseball player. Right. That's right. all, and that's the same thing in Mexico. And I loved it. Mm -hmm. What about in your time as a baseball player, the temptations that, uh, that, that, that came before you? You know, today, athletes are tempted by money. Uh, they're tempted by drugs. Mm -hmm. They're tempted by women. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we often act as if that is something new to this generation of players, both in football and, uh, and baseball and basketball as well. Was it the same in your time? Were there those temptations as there are well, now? Well, not as many. But 
It's over since Adam and Eve, that temptation's been there, yes. you know, man and woman. <laughs> but the thing about it, during my era, we, the, we were the pursuers, men. Men pursued women. That's right. right. But now, it just could be the opposite. Uh -huh. Really, because I, I look at the baseball park. I look at the baseball park, and I see who's hanging around the baseball park. And I see if a woman sees a man she likes, she goes for him. Wherein before, uh-uh, you had to go for her. And uh, were you an angel in your time, or did you, uh, did you uh, fall victim to temptation now? And I think I, 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 I did the things just about every man would do. I was single. I was single until I was 35. That's right. Yeah, I was. But I, 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 one thing, though, I, I was always a one-woman man. Mm -hmm. I didn't like to, the entire field. And what about, of course, back in those days, I suppose drugs weren't as readily available, but what about alcohol? Was that a temptation? Oh, yeah, now people drank. People drank, but I never acquired the taste for alcohol. I didn't, I didn't like it. Right. I would do a little social drinking just to be along with the group, you know, but I'd always keep that glass there, and it would stay full until I got ready to I leave. I got you. I've often wondered, you know, like they say, Babe Ruth drank quite a bit. Yeah. And, and I often wonder how a man could, uh, you know, could go to the, uh, the baseball park with a hangover, and, and perform. Let me tell you something. See, with, 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 with whiskey, all you got to do is, is take your good shower, you know what I mean, and you come to the baseball park, you're ready. But it's the difference now if you're going to lay up there with a woman all night, <laughs> that's going to take your strength. So what's going to happen now, you, it's going to take a little time for you to come back. <laughs> Oh, well, she's got you, boy. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for a guy who didn't do none of that stuff, you certainly know the rules and regulations very well. well. I did a little of it now. No, no, okay. don't get okay. me wrong. I wasn't any saint, you know. I was a man. And now you're single till you're 35, and then you met your wife before you went off to the war. Yeah. And then when you went off to the war, we talked about this the last time. What, what, what was your job in the war? I was, uh, I was uh, 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 over a, a stevedore platoon. In the war, I was in the navy, uh, in the navy at the time, and that's that's what I did. I, I was stevedore, and uh, so. But with Ora, I had met Ora then, you know. And, right. And and but uh, it was kind of the navy at the time was was really a tough for a black guy, because most people in the navy, most black guys in the navy, he was a, a steward or, or something like that in the navy. But I was in the Navy CBs, and so we loaded, unloaded the ships, building uh, runways and different things like Hard that. Hard work, though, huh? Yeah, and, but the, the thing about it is uh, a man told me once, he was a young lieutenant, and he said, if you were white, you know, you would be an officer. And he thought this was complimenting me. Yeah. 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 And, but do you know how it made me feel? Of course, yes. Yeah. I got to be white to be that. I'm yeah. who I am. Yeah, you're fi I'm, I'm yeah. fighting for my country, yeah. serving my country. Yeah, right. I'm fighting just like anyone else. And, uh, we went to a ship once to, to unload some stuff from a ship. And it was time for taps, and the, the uh, young officer was on deck, and we were downstairs in the bar. He to come up, and they started playing these taps. And, he said, attention, niggas. Yeah. And uh, I got up, and I looked at him, and I looked at him, and I walked up that, that ladder. When I got there, I didn't take my eyes off him. I said, do you realize what you have said to Navy personnel? And then the captain came up, and, and I told him what this man had said. And he said, you just to be more intelligent than that, to say something like that to a fella Navy man. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What did he say, the man that used the word? Huh? Did well, you... he was actually, he was embarrassed now that he had said it. But I probably, you know what I mean, it was something he had said all his sure, life. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. And I guess he didn't think we, we minded if he said that. You know, it probably, in that time, probably the white mind could not understand uh, the black mind, could, or, 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 and could not understand the sensitivity that, that people would have uh, when a word like that was said that was so derogatory and so humiliating to yeah. people. They, 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 they just couldn't comprehend it, I guess. No, well, and it's, 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 it's a lot of things they would do. It was the, I remember a kid, I don't know if I told you the last time I was here, that a kid said to, we were playing in Denver. 
playing a good semi-pro team, and Satchel was pitching. First guy, kid, get up, and he hit the ball. He swung hard as he could. He talked it for a base hit. The next guy did the same thing, base hit. Two in, two men on, nobody out. And the kid sitting in the ring said, oh, he's just an overrated darky. Come on, let's whip him. And Satchel said, Nancy, did you hear what he said? Nancy, <laughs> Nancy. <laughs> I said, yeah, I heard him. He said, well, and Nancy, bring him in. I said, okay, I thought he wanted me to bring the outfield halfway in, and yeah. I brought him halfway in. He said, Nancy, bring him in. I brought him into the edge of the grass, you know, infield grass. He said, Nancy, bring him all the way in. And you should see there's seven of us kneeling around the mound. Satchel walked this kid that said what he did say. Then he threw nine pitches, and the side was out. Nine strikes. Nobody <laughs> touched it, and you know what he said. He said, uh, Overrated darky, eh? <laughs> and the kid that said it now, the kid that said it, he was from Texas, and actually he was crying because the other guys had told him, you know, the other guy told him, say he shouldn't have said that. But he thought, he thought that wasn't a bad word because this was an easy word, you know, darky. Yeah. He thought that was all right because yeah. what he had been accustomed to saying was something else. Even worse, right? Yeah, yeah. you understand what I mean? Sure, I mean, he thought sure. it, but, but, uh, but. I think it was a lesson for him right there. Mm -hmm. I hope the lesson was well learned. I'm quite sure it yeah, was. I bet right. he never said it. And for those who wonder, wonder why Satchel would call uh, Buck O'Neill Nancy, you'll have to get a videotape or a transcript of the other show because I don't have time for him to tell that story all over. But it's a great... Buy my book. Or, or, right or, on time. Or, or buy the book, I Was Right On Time, and you'll find it in there. we got a lot of selling here to do tonight. Memberships, books, and records. Buck O'Neill returns you on the toll-free after this break. We are back with uh, Buck O'Neill. Here is Trish on the toll free in Huntington, West Virginia. Hi, Trish, and welcome to CBS Late Night. Hello. Hello, Tom. How Hi. are you? I'm fine, thanks. I hope you are, Trish. Uh, fantastic. Good. Yes, I'd like to uh, ask Mr. O'Neill what is his secret to longevity, and what is it? Uh, do you feel any different at 87 than you, than you did when you were 10 years old? Well, and I didn't know how I felt when I was 10 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't, but I, I feel good now. I feel great, really, and uh, the I think I, I, I lived like most men live, but it's, it, it was in my genes. All the men in my family lived a long time, and uh, they were slender, slender people. My daddy, oh, 6'4", weighed about 220 pounds. He was a beautiful black sucker boy. My daddy <laughs> was. Uh, okay, no daily secrets as to anything special that you do on a regular basis? Mm-hmm. Stretch. Stretch. I run every morning. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Had a great meal tonight, and I ate a dessert a little more than I think I should, but I'm going to run an extra mile tomorrow for that. Uh -huh. How many miles do you do each morning? Well, I, 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 I will do maybe five. Oh, really? Yeah, but I, I do it on the treadmill. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, that's fantastic. Trish, I'm glad you called. He's a great gentleman, and I'm glad you joined our conversation yes, tonight. I enjoy it immensely. Okay. Have a great evening. All right, Trish. Bye uh -huh. now. Bye-bye. Let me ask you here about uh, losing your love. Your, your, your mm -hmm. wife succumbed to cancer just about a year ago. Yeah. Um, still lonesome, or? Well, the toughest part for me, Tom, is going home to an empty house. Yeah. I've been traveling all my life, but... I'd go home, or was there with somebody there? But right now, like I'm going back home now. When I go back home tomorrow, ain't nobody gonna be there. That's the that's the tough part about it. But as far as uh, as grieving, no, oh, I, I, you know, if I would cry, I wouldn't cry for Aura. We had a great life together. I'd cry for the people that didn't get a chance to meet that magnificent woman. Mm -hmm. Oh, you talking about a woman, man? Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> How does she feel about marrying a ball player? You know, at the time, ball players, as you say, they traveled a lot. Their income depended upon their ability. If, you know, they slowed a step or, you know, didn't run quite as fast, they maybe didn't make as much money. How would she feel about security marrying a baseball player? Well, and one thing about it is, see, Aura, this, see, I was 35 before marriage, uh -huh. and I had known some people. Yeah, but I had never known a woman that I thought I'd want to spend the rest of my life with. But I think the great attraction... For me, with Aura, was this. Aura was marrying me for what I was, for what I was. She didn't 
want to marry me to change me. Right, right. And this is what I think a lot of mistakes. You think you're going to change a person. Uh -uh. That's a big mistake. And so, <laughs> or say, I know what you are. I'm going to marry you. I love you for just what you are. Yeah, a baseball player. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and what about this term that we've heard about so many young African-Americans? He or she is a gifted athlete. Now, there's, there's something else I've never understood. I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of insulting. Yeah. Because any athlete got to work at the trade. I don't care, white, green, gray, whatever. That has nothing to do with it. Mm -mm. No, you, you're an athlete. And you got to work at your trade, because if you don't, yeah. hey, I've seen a lot of gifted af athletes, really. Yes, you and, have. And, 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 and I've seen guys walk right by them that wasn't as gifted, because the one that wasn't as gifted worked at the trade where the other guy didn't. He just depended on natural ability. How, how hard did you have to work as a baseball player? I loved working at a baseball player, so it was never hard, just like right now. I enjoy running. Right. I enjoy stretching. You know what I mean? When I miss it, I, I, I feel something. I, I got to catch a plane and move. Like, I got to get up. They're going to pick us up at 4 30 in the morning. But I'm going to be up uh -huh. at 3 30 because I'm going to jog in that hotel room just about 100 steps and stretch before. I leave. Got you. So, so it's not work to you. It's not. No, no, no. But it's I mean, effort. I mean, you. It, 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 feel, it makes me feel good. Would you say that you're a disciplined man? I imagine so. Yeah, yeah. I imagine so. Yeah, that when you see a mark that you have to hit, by God, yeah, you're going to hit that mark, right? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. We're chatting here with Buck O'Neill, uh, who will be uh, 87 years old on Friday and who is part of a, a, a drive now to gain membership to the uh, National Negro League Baseball Museum, which is located in Kansas City. Back with Buck and you on the toll free as time permits now after this short timeout. <laughs> With baseball player Buck O'Neill, here is Steve on the toll-free in Charleston, Illinois. Hi, Steve. Welcome to CBS. Hello. How you doing, T.S.? Okay, thanks. Uh, Buck, do you think the players are making more than what, you, what they are actually worth today? No, no. No, no. If the money's there, yes. if the money's there, they wouldn't be paying them if the money wasn't there. See, because I, I remember when they weren't paying them. I remember when baseball players were making the minimum in the major leagues, $5,000. And after the season was over, he was in the post office or selling cars. He was doing something to take care of his family. Now, he doesn't have to do that. So the money's there. The money's there. Why not get a piece of it? Are they working as hard as you, though, as the players of the past did? Some of them is working, working harder. And some of them working not as hard. That's always been the story. See, everybody in the major leagues now, I, I, I'm an old time, and everybody want me to say that Major League Baseball was so great doing that. Major League Baseball was great, and Major League, we got great baseball players now. Look at the guys this year. Huh? And who was any better than Ken Griffey? I don't care Nobody. when you play. Nobody. Nobody. Yeah, the same thing. So, so it's the same thing. So, so, but do you worry about the money to get in, but... You're making more money than your father made or your grandfather made, aren't you? Yeah. Of course. What about Mike Piazza? Huh? Mike Piazza, million? $91 million. New well, York. one thing about it is they got to be 90 million, $91 million there if he's going to get the $90 million. The correct. man thinks he's going to make his money off of this man. That's correct. This is, they he's think gonna make he's the 91 million. Money. He's going to make the $91 million and more There you back. go. That's back. it. Yeah. Yeah, you see, Steve, the great thing is we won't have to run a tag day for the owner of the New York Mets. He's, <laughs> yeah. he's going to be fine. Are you a baseball fan, Steve? Big baseball fan. You see, you, uh, th then you had to love this season, huh? I loved it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I so I had a chance to see him play. Whew. Yes. Great. Uh, Tom? Yes, sir. Eastern Illinois is going to miss you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for calling, and I'll, help you. I'll talk to you again, okay, young okay. man? All right, bye-bye. You know, there's a, uh, there's a possibility, and you've probably read this speculation, that, uh, that Jackie Robinson was not the first black player in the major leagues. Yeah. That there, oh. there might have been one before. Oh, or, of course. Or, it was, yeah, yeah, a long time ago. It was a long time ago, and he was a, a good baseball player. But uh, he didn't last long in the major leagues because of the people in the major leagues, the players. Uh, Cap Anson. Cap Anson was a star during that time and uh, how long ago was this and, book? oh this was in the 18 oh well, before the turn of the century yeah, then yeah sure
Joe. And uh, the beginning of the major leagues. So, and Cap didn't want him to play, so everybody else didn't want him to play. So it was a, uh, it wasn't, uh, it was an unwritten law. Got you. Mm -hmm. So Jackie Robinson will be the first that not only played but stayed. Stayed. Yeah. I want to ask you about one man. Last time you told the story about Nancy, uh, there there was a fellow in your life named Floyd. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say what his first name was. You can if you want. Yeah. Well, and his name was, we called him Jew Baby Floyd. Jew his Baby Floyd. His name was Frank Floyd, but we called him Jew Baby Floyd because he had worked uh, all his life around Kansas City with, with, uh, uh, with uh, the Jewish people. And we called him Jew Baby. Jew Baby. Jew Baby. Jew Baby was dogger than I was. But <laughs> <laughs> he called him Jew Baby Floyd. And great trainer. Had great fingers. He had great fingers. And, and he could go into that muscle and just, oh, just... Strip all the pain out of it. Really? Mm -hmm. That's what he did for Satchel Page. He brought Satchel's arm back. No yeah. surgery, no. Uh, no, 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 no. Just he would rub it and rub, rub it and put those fingers. He put those fingers there. Any potions or elixirs or I mean, he would, liniments? They had some rubbing stuff and more or less alcohol and 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 uh, different liniments and things like that. You ever work for you? Or, or, or work, work, work on about. you? I ain't never been sick. I ain't never been hurting. No, I really, God's been good to me. Mm-hmm. Never heard. You've been good to him, too, pal. What you talking about? Uh, I you love him, too. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you have a great day in Kansas City on Friday, and I hope a lot of people sign up for membership, and I, I'm honored that you came back to see us tonight. I'm so glad, and I'm sure we're going to have a successful time in Kansas City because all my friends, they're coming. Okay. Uh -huh, and everybody in Kansas City are coming to my birthday. Isn't that wonderful? That's terrific. Happy, yeah. happy, Buck. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Okay, sir. Buck O'Neill is the guest. Next, we'll talk with Joy Kraus about her amazing story of rags to riches right after this timeout. When Joy Krause was 27 years old, her husband walked out, leaving her with two kids and all kinds of bills. There was nowhere else to turn, so Joy put an ad in the paper. It said, cleaning lady for hire, windows included. And soon she had clients and eventually a successful business. Two years ago, with more than 30 employees working for her, he show, she sold the business and retired to Florida. And she writes about this amazing journey in spring cleaning for the uh, soul. It's a pleasure to welcome Joy to our program, and thanks for I, I've told your whole story. You don't even have to tell it. <laughs> But I mean, here you were. Here you were with two kids, uh -huh. and and I mean, you could have applied for a job, maybe, or looked through the want ads, you yeah. know, for for a job. But instead, you you put an ad, I'll clean houses and I'll do windows. Well, there wasn't time really to think about options. We had it, it was an immediate decision, and I thought, how can I make money fast now? Right. And uh, I literally looked around at what we had to our name, and we had an old pickup truck that was uh, rusty and cranky, but had gas in it and cleaning supplies underneath the sink. And I put that ad in the paper. And what was and the response? Was right away did you get oh, a Oh, yeah, immediately. I guess, you know, people never did uh, do windows. They didn't do them then. They don't do them they now. They don't so. do them now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so and, I kind of put those two things and together. What, and, and what did you charge? What was your first rate, uh, uh, day rate? I'll tell you, the first house I cleaned, I remember it. I uh, went in and I looked around. A lady wanted a large cleaning. Uh, a spring cleaning mm -hmm. and I thought I looked around it didn't look dirty to me right. but I didn't had moved anything right so I gave her a price of sixty two dollars and when you're broke sixty two dollars is like sixty two hundred dollars sure. right sure. so I thought it's no no problem I'll get this done in a couple of hours it took me two full days because when I started moving the furniture I realized that there were a lot of dust bunnies in that that's house that's where there the dirt is <laughs> that's right and I opened the oven and I had to do that and it was exhausting but I got my sixty two dollars and uh, how many clients did you, did you get a lot of clients right away were you were you working five six days a week right off the bat I was working around the clock and what I do was I I'd pack the cleaning supplies in the back of the pickup and the playpen and I'd put the children in the front and we'd literally bounce along from house to house and I don't know, you know, people have asked me about those years because I took the children with me. Mm -hmm. And they say, how could you do that? Yeah. You know, I mean, there were lots of times where I'd be waxing a floor and the kids would fuss. And I'd have to stop what I was doing, walk back across that floor and hope I didn't fall and break my neck. And, and you know, and you do it. You just do it. It got done. And was it fun for a while and then it got old? 
it was I mean, it's an hard, automatic it, it, pilot it, it, it's, for it's a few hard work. Years. I mean, I yeah. have I, I have yeah. a, a a couple that yeah. I hire. I have a regular housekeeper a couple of days a week, oh, but uh, but twice a year I call another service because mm -hmm. they do the heavy stuff. You know where they pull yes. the furniture out and get behind yes. where all the dusties are and that stuff. Right. You know because the the housekeeper doesn't do that all the time. No, uh-uh. She doesn't. She's very good it. at folding the toilet paper like they do in the hotel. <laughs> so I think the bathroom has been cleaned. That's right. Um, did you I do, have to did, say did that. Did you do that too? The folded toilet oh, paper. Oh yeah, we had that touch, and then we did the straight lines in the carpet. We're kind of known, but no bonbons on the pillowcase. You know, we <laughs> drew the line there. But um, I was sort of on automatic pilot because we had a pile of bills at first, and I needed to get those paid. Sure. And uh, but then about the third year, I was exhausted. I was it's working work, around boy, the clock. You, huh? I was, and I was starting to have a, a pity party for myself. You know, poor me. I'm a single mom. I'm scrubbing toilets. So, ugh, ugh. But a couple of things happened to me in that third year that really changed my life and the way I looked at what I and did. And those things were? Well, one of them was um, I got a call one day from a lawyer, and he said, "We have a house in the suburbs, a small house." Um, I've called all over town. He said, no one will clean this house. It was a scene of a homicide. Murder house. Yeah, a murder house. And I said, uh, well, I'm not going to do it. And he said, you can write your own check. And I said, I'll do it. You know, I'll do it. And I called around. I thought I could get someone to help me. And I couldn't. So I went over there. And there was a mother and her, it was a single mom, and her two small children were killed in that house. So I started very early in the morning. And I scrubbed down the walls, and I took the children's crayon drawings from the wall, and I had to put them in trash bags and take them to the curb. And it was heart-wrenching, yeah. heart-wrenching. And I thought that I had seen the worst of it until I got to the kitchen. And on the kitchen counter, there was the mother's appointment book. Yeah. And I flipped it open, and the book, she was a junior bank executive. And the book was jam-packed with business appointments. There wasn't a bit of white space. And I thought about my work schedule, and I thought how I had complained about being a single mom right. and all the burden of it. And I thought if that mom had to do it all over again, there would be a lot more white space in that book. And the next day, I put another ad in the paper, and I hired my first helper. Uh-huh. And uh, when you hired helpers, yes. did you test them in any way to make sure that, you know, they, 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 they were oh, competent? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. We had a whole set of videos. We, we oh, really? Showed, yeah. And most people would do okay, you know, because we'd, we'd give them a uh, quick test afterwards. But there was one gal that came in, and uh, she was the only one that got a perfect score. Really? On this got test. Got them all right, huh? All, she got them all right. Well, what were some and of the we'd never seen that like, before. What were some of the questions? Uh, like uh, identifying some of the vacuum cleaners. What does a Panasonic 211 look like? Oh, you know, okay. and that kind. Of, and what would you use for for heavy soap buildup? You know, would you use this cleanser or that I cleanser? Got you. So okay. that kind of thing. But if you haven't been in that kind of business before, you, you just know. wouldn't know these things, she knew right? Them all, huh? so she knew everything. She was so smart, this woman, and she had a whole page, an extra page on her application of all this education she okay, had. Okay, let me, let me do a fast break and Go we'll ahead. get to the wind-up of the story the, <laughs> of, of the woman who knew all the answers. My guest is Joy Krause. The, bo Krause. the book is called Spring Cleaning for the Soul, and we'll be right back after this short break. With uh, Joy Krauss, uh, and I want to hear another lady got a perfect score. What kind of an employee was she? She was fabulous. We all thought she'd leave the minute she broke a nail, you know, because she had actually left uh, an important job. She was an editor at Random House, and she had this was her dream job. So we could not understand why she would come work for a cleaning company scrubbing floors, uh -huh. and we were very suspicious of her, especially one girl, Becky. And to make matters worse, um, this gal, Barbara, used to wear a beeper. And she was kind of secretive about her, or she was quiet about her home life. Right. So we really didn't know what yeah, she was she all about. Job, we knew she was overqualified, but she did a good job. Okay. And she stayed with us for about 10 months. Well, one day we got a phone call from her, and she said, I'm sorry, I have to take some time off. I have some, something to do with my family. So we thought, okay, this is the perfect opportunity, right? Yeah. We'll go to her customers, and we'll see what's really going on with this gal. Yeah. So the gal that was the most suspicious, Becky, said, I volunteer. I'll go. And she went to the first house, 
and the lady said, oh, sit down, have some tea. I want to, you know, I'd like to talk to you. Barbara and I always had tea together before she started. So Becky sat down with her and she said, would you please give me the lowdown on Barbara? Yeah. And uh, Mrs. Animator said, I'd love to. What a lovely girl. Do you know that she writes short stories and poems and she brings one to her customers every time she cleans? Wow. And she said, it's too bad about the accident. And what happened was this. A year before, when she, just before she came to work for yeah. us, her parents were in a terrible automobile accident and they were killed. And her brother, Scotty, who was 19, was paralyzed. And Barbara had to make a decision whether or not to have him institutionalized. And she said, there's no way my brother is going to be institutionalized. So she, floors so she left care. that job, that editor job, came back to her old neighborhood, her old house, and took a job where she could leave. That was the beeper. She could leave during the day when she needed to, mm -hmm. and she didn't have to work nights or weekends. So you had a different yes. opinion of Barbara after that? Oh, huh? I'll tell you yeah. something. She taught us all a lesson about judging people. By the way, where was your company when you owned it? Where did all the... Well, originally in California, uh -huh. here in California. My children were born here. Okay. And then uh, about a few years later, I moved it back east to Rhode Island. And now it's uh -huh. been sold to somebody else? Yeah, it's, it's, just a couple of years still ago. still in operation? Does it have oh, a name? Oh, yeah. Oh, he's, he's expanded it. He's doing all kinds of frilly things with it. And you went to high school, I read this afternoon, with the actor James Woods. I did, uh-huh. We were in a play together in 11th grade, uh, Lillian Hellman's The Little Foxes, and it was the first time uh, Jimmy uh, stepped on a stage in his life. And he, he was the valedictorian of our class, he was the big was brain, he, he's a brilliant man, yes. And he got bitten by the acting bug in the 11th grade. Mm -hmm. And later, in a, I, I read that in a, in a magazine interview, he mentioned the experience he had with you in, in high school. That was amazing. Yeah, he did. Um, he called me the tough-looking Italian kid that I played opposite. <laughs> <laughs> he was in that play. He was my husband, Oscar, and the wife, Batterer, and I was his drunken wife, Bertie. <laughs> In a high school play. <laughs> in a high school play, The Little Foxes. So um, I'd always had this little pocket of envy for him. And his brother, what really made it worse was his brother Michael had a video shop right next to my cleaning shop. So Michael always filled me in, you know, on the latest yeah, day. He's up to five million here and this and that, you know. Well, I kind of took it in stride, but... Um, when that article came out, I, I read the article, and it was a tribute. It, he was very kind to mention me in this article. And it really, I was sitting in a Dodge Omni with retreads, you know. Yeah. The tailpipe was hanging down, and I thought, you know, he's probably in a limousine somewhere. And I started crying. I mean, I was very, very sad, again, feeling sorry for myself. Pity party, huh? That, um, but you later, you later met him uh, when, when uh, he had a death in his family, and he gave mm -hmm. you a lecture, didn't he? Just five years ago, yeah. uh-huh. And when I walked in the room, he came over, he came, got out of the line, and gave me a hug, and he said, come on, let's go talk. And we went over in the back in the fold-out chairs, and uh, he wanted to know about, you know, my life yeah. and this and that. And I said, what do you care about my life? You know, I've been cleaning houses for 20 years. Here you are, you know. Movie star. Movie yeah. star, you know, this and that. And... I don't know, it just, it, I just, it just came out of me. And he said, let me tell you about Hollywood. And he started telling me some of the other side of Hollywood that mm -hmm. I didn't know, how tough it is, is climb up the ladder. And he said to me, and he had tears in his eyes, and he said, do you know how lucky you are? Because I guess Michael, his brother, had been telling, filling him yep. in, and I didn't know yep. that. He said, Joy, you have two healthy children. And you know he's never had children. Nope. And he said, you've been your own boss all these years, and you can walk down the street, you know, in, in privacy. And uh, End of pity party. That was it, man. That, was, that did it for me. He gave me a great gift that day, Tom. I'm glad to see you. Congratulations Thank on you. your success. It's wonderful to meet you. Well, it's nice to meet you. Continued <laughs> success you. And, my, and, and my best to your family, okay? How are your Thank kids, you. okay? My son's here. Oh, they're okay? Fantastic. Terrific. Joy Krause is the guest, and the book, which is an amazing story of her odyssey, is called Spring Cleaning for the Soul. We'll be right back to tell you about tomorrow after these messages. You know what's great about having your own show is the guests give you presents when they leave. Buck O'Neill gave me this replica hat from the 1942 uh, Kansas City Monarchs, the Negro Baseball League. And then Joy Kraus gave me this little miniature crapper. <laughs> she 
said it's for when you're feeling crappy. <laughs> Which is not now. Tomorrow night, Mary Lou Henner and Ed McMahon. Keep in mind, the tongue weighs practically nothing, but so few people can hold it. Good night, everybody. Thank you.